Hi, and welcome back to my shed. I'm the Shed Dweller and my name is Paul Hopewell. I make all sorts of parts and components, some are experimental and I share with you what I went through to get the finished product. In this video I make an experimental drill sharpener. Ok, it didn't turn out as planned, but I learnt plenty from it. As a result, I now have plans for a less complicated Mark II version. This one is my current sharpening device. It works quite well, but I'm used to working on a Briley drill sharpener, but I can't afford one, nor can I afford the space that I require to put one in my very cramped workshop. I would have liked to have made a drill sharpener with a six jaw chuck, but the nearest I've got to that, that I thought might work, is a range of collets. They do grab the drills very well. This time I had a go at designing the project on paper first, instead of just grabbing a bunch of junk and grafting a working tool out of it. And here's the result. The device worked to a degree and the drills cut true and clean, but no matter how much adjusting and calibrating I did, the web angle and width remain cruelly unobtainable. And unless you're a glutton for punishment, this is all until the Mark II version. For those of you that would like to see how I made the components for this drill sharpener, pin your eyelids back and make sure your coffee's hot. To start with, most of the processes took quite a long time to do, so some of, well, most of the video will be sped up. So if at any time things go at a blurred pace, that's why. A large part of the video is missing. This is because, had the project been successful, I would have made three videos about it, showing everything I did and why. But because the end project didn't go to plan, I'll show you some sections of the project that could get used in the Mark II version later in the year. The base plate is where I started this project, and because I'm using a CAD generated drawing, all dimensions should work, and I simply worked to that. I still modified the base plate by adding two slots later. Um, this was to add a little adjustment should it be required during tune-up. You may be wondering why make a drill sharpener when you've already got one. I want a one-shot drill sharpener. That is, once the drill bit is set in place, it stays there until it's fully sharpened. Handling the drill bit between cuts can introduce errors and therefore create an unbalanced drill bit, ending in holes much bigger than the drill bit. This was an interesting way of dealing with the 8mm by 212mm radius slot. The base plate was attached to a fixed aluminium plate through a pivot point and a makeshift horizontal jack pulled the base plate through a brass clamp that was tight enough to resist cutter grab but not quite tight enough to prevent the material being pulled from under it. Okay, it's not the best machining practice and there's a risk something could have gone wrong, but it worked. These two slots are being recessed and they're being recessed to trap two upturned standard 8mm bolts. And that's the base plate done. Making and finishing the advanced tube or the drill spindle in one go was going to be tricky. So they were both first roughed out and then finished machined in a particular order. Okay. 
I started with the spindle, first by roughing it out all over. Then after roughing out the collet opening, the main part of the spindle was finished machined to achieve a parallel finish. The advanced tube is the component that provides all the cutting action and allows the spindle to be rotated inside it. This enables the gripped drill bit to be aligned and locked in place by the thimble. At this point I'd end and centred both ends using a steady and now I've made a steady track to hopefully remove any ovality when I drill and bore and eventually finish through. This is a novel way of machining a setting path near the jaws. I used a long high speed steel sh tool sharp enough to split the atom. Then I machined backwards through the steady rest at the slowest speed I could. I did this because I realised I needed another setting track near the jaws to ensure concentricity at both ends of this advanced tube and having two external setting paths is the best way. The bore is still under size but I made a plug for this end for resetting purposes. Because one end is having a 10mm long flange on it I have to take it out of the jaws and reposition it. The setting tracks and a little bit of cigarette paper is used to keep the bore as true as possible. At this time there is still a bit of material to come out of the bore and off the outside diameter. The dead centre is being inserted now while everything is clean and the advanced tube is being returned between the chuck and the tailstock to centralise and align the material. Two V blocks are placed underneath but on top of two spaces of the right thickness to support the advanced tube when it's released. After knocking out the bung the line touring bar can be fitted and this is to machine out the bore to the required size. The spindle was returned to the lathe and reset before backing the tailstock away to get the advanced tube on. It's held in place by using a little bit of scrap and a jubilee clip. Again not best machining practice but it's working. A driver dog is then fitted to the advanced tube to be driven by the jaws. It goes without saying that the machining at this point is done very carefully.
When this op is done, the tube is removed and returned to the spindle and held in a similar fashion as before to finish off the flange dimension. This is where I'd finished the collet cone and also created the outside collet nut thread. This thread groove is to serve as a visual indicator. The idea was to prevent having the thread from bottoming in out or overreaching. I'm putting a spanner or wrench flats on here. After fitting an end stop, I put two V blocks up against two T slot rests. After finishing the first flat, I used a small engineer spirit level for confirmation. Then reset the flat to the underside and using the same spirit level position clamped the tube in place. That's good enough. I rotated the spindle to put a small flat on one side. It was to prevent the grub screws damaging the spindle finish and preventing any binding. Now it was time to open up the inside thread clearance recess on the advanced tube Then the internal 40 by 1.5 mm collet thread was formed. Time to confirm that the two main components will fit. The flange is to have two 11 by 4 by 4 sealed roller bearings mounted opposite each other and held in place by two 4mm screws. They will be running on a rise and fall rail machined to one side of a swivel block. Here I'm using the centre finder that I had to repair. I made a video showing how I did that. These are the two 4mm bearing screw holes. They are both 3.5mm deep and don't break through. This 30mm offset is what was calculated to be the angular position to machine a flat on the main outside diameter of the advanced tube. This was also provided to prevent grub screws damaging any of the machine surfaces. The same system of supporting and clamping was used on the drill spindle. This is both the advanced tube and the drill spindle assembled and finished. 
This piece is the swivel block. Its job is to allow the advanced tube to rotate, while at the same time advance the tube forward twice per revolution. This while allowing the tube to nod up and down. On one side of the swivel block will be a rail for two ball bearings to ride on. This rail is being formed right now. This bore is a sliding fit over the advanced tube. The rail is actually a cam, but I don't want to confuse this part with another. This marking blue is prep for the swivel screw holes and for the rise and fall timing, in order to get the rise and fall equal and opposite along the rail. I used some of these marks on the sign plate to achieve equal rise and fall, but I know that it will need tuning later. Both of these swivel holes are drilled and tapped to M6. Using a scribe and sign plate combination easily provided the rise and fall to be fairly balanced. After scribing, I punched dots along it to follow the intended rail path. The marks would still be visible after roughing the rail with the angle grinder. After roughing the rise and fall rail, the material had hardened a little so the initial filing was pretty tough going. By now the rail was ready for tuning. And this was done by fitting a couple of bearings to the advanced tube and sitting the tube in place. Rotating the tube, the unequal high spots on the rail would cause one bearing to rotate and the other one to remain stationary. Then one simply polishes off a little material from under the rotating wheel and try again until both bearings rotate at an equal pace. That's it, job done. This is the larger of the two gears and it will be responsible for rotating the advanced tube. I'm using a bit of offcut that's got some previous machining remnants on it. It's this way round because there's a bit missing out of the bore on the other side. Even so, I'll have to alter my initial plans for cutting the gear teeth. To mount this gear blank into the gear indexer I'll have to use one of the indexer's bushes to support the gear. That'll mean putting a keyway on the inside and outside of the bush and one on the inside of the gear. But first I need to get the gear to snugly accept the bush. That's snug enough.
This is where I part the gear blank from the other bit. Easy peasy, now to clean up the back face. It's the middle one of these three bushes is the one that I'll have to modify by putting a 6mm wide slot in the bore and on the OD. Then I've got to slot the gear blank. Now they can be assembled onto the gear index fixture with a couple of 6mm keys. After cutting the second tooth I discovered I hadn't tightened the cutting tool tight enough. So after resetting the tool and cutting a few more teeth I decided to repair the damaged teeth rather than make another gear blank. What I did was to overbuild with weld and then remove the high spots back to the correct dimensions. It's a bit bumpy doing it this way but I used a high speed steel tool to remove the high spots and cleaned it up all over. A bit of cigarette paper biased the weld material toward the cutter. That turned out OK. After returning the gear blank back to the shape of fixture, I continued to complete all of the remaining teeth before recutting that bad area. I also made another pass through the next few teeth, just to be sure. The black area you see around the affected area is permanent marker. This is where I finished the bore to fit over the advanced tube. It'll also get a 4mm tapped hole for a grub screw to lock it onto the tube.
This is the smaller of the two gears. The process it went through was the same as the larger gear. It's made of brass because this material was already at blank size sporting a 14mm bore. All it needed was shortening and a keyway in the bore. As a brass gear it should allow both gears to interact as gears do as well as slide longitudinally together. Here I'm making a reducing bush to be pressed into the brass gear. This bush is drilled and finished to allow fitment of a 10mm diameter bar. In order to aid assembly and disassembly I need a grub screw arrangement as a temporary solution for now. A circlip and keyway would be a better solution after tuning and testing. This part is going to be the cam. This cam is supposed to provide continuous vertical action to the advance tube and this vertical action is the key to cutting the relief angle on the drill bit. Behind the cam is a loose spacer washer. It's preventing the cam from being pushed back into the jaws while I rough it out. You can see that there is quite a bit of material to be removed. This is the same cam, but it's in its pre-finished state. I lightly pressed two spare bits of material into the ball for marking out purposes. It didn't have to be two bits, it just worked out that way. The two marked out rings provide points of origin to mark out the cam arcs. As with the cams on the swivel block, the cam was marked out and then dot punched along the intended scribe lines. It's worth noting that rapid stock removal to a scribed line will almost always burn the marking blue, destroying the scribe line and that is why I use dot marks along the scribe lines. Once the scribed lines are laid, the temporary boss is removed. The excess material was ground out with an angle grinder again before being finished on the belt sander. This is the thimble. It was going to be marked out like a micrometer thimble but it uh, didn't work out that way. It's a bit of spare stainless steel tube that didn't really need any external machining. After the end face and bore was finished it was rotated in the jaws and further bored out to leave a thin outer shell. This in turn was faced off to a slight external chamfer. These are the brackets and guides that would have taken up a huge amount of time to show how I made them. These alone would have taken a whole episode in their own right. One shown here is very involved and like one other has its own ball bearings. The process for making this two directional upstand was quite complicated. To help with roughing out of this part I used the bandsaw to make as many cuts as I could to assist the milling process. All the support brackets were made using aluminium or aluminium simply because I may have had to remake some or all of them as the testing and tuning process progressed. As it turned out it was a good choice. What follows is a quick assembly of the whole device. The spindle is inserted into the advance tube then two 11mm ball bearings are fitted followed by the swivel block with the rail facing toward the bearings. Next I fitted a thrust bearing and a spring. Both of these items took a bit of finding. Another item is fitted on the advanced tube is the 78 tooth gear and it is locked into place followed by the cam. A hardened steel roller fitted with ball bearings was bolted to the side of the rise and fall guide. 
The winder up stand was fitted to the base plate, followed by the two directional support after it was fitted with bearings. The single support leg with bearings was the next after two bolts were placed in position, followed by the rear rise and fall guide. The spindle assembly was inserted and attached by the two pivoting screws through the sealed bearings. Now the thimble and locking mechanism are added. And lastly the hand wheel, shaft and small gear are assembled and locked into place with a simple collar and grub screw. Using a bit of spare round stock to simulate the grinding wheel, I give you an idea of how it should work. Then I try it for real, and this is where after many hours of tuning and retuning, I begin to understand that it just wasn't meant to be. As I explained at the beginning of the video, the drill was ground and cut very well. It was the web width and the angle that would prove to be the difficulty. I'm not a quitter and from this I learnt a few things and I'll use that information when I make the Mark II. The stone I use here is a roughing stone and it will show on the drill bit. Well, although the end result didn't go to plan, maybe you saw something that was of use. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Bye.